Hi, everyone. Eric Prince, co-founder of Marion West. I'm joined today for a conversation with Vezi Dutoy. He is a South African-born writer living in Sussex, England. His areas of interest, as he puts it on his website, are design, aesthetics, history, and culture. He writes at Substack, having also published essays and articles in Apollo, on Herd, Tablet, The Critic, and other publications. So Vezi, thank you for uh, joining me today. Looking forward to our conversation. As am I, thank you very much. So maybe you can start by telling us a little bit about your background. How does one, you're a relatively young guy, how does one sort of become a writer these days? What was the confluence of events, so to speak, that brought you to being uh, a writer, essayist, and uh, I guess from there taking on some of the topics that you do? Uh, well, I mean, if you want to begin at the beginning, I was born in South Africa, but I grew up in Berkshire, which is west of London. Um, I, I was, I always, I loved writing since, I've loved writing since I was a teenager, really, and reading. Uh, and then I suppose after I graduated from university, I uh, managed to get a few pieces published. I was originally writing about art. Um, and then, well, and then everything just sort of unfolded from there. I decided to stick at it. Um, all the, and well, I, I didn't write about art for that long. I quickly started sort of exploring other topics. Um, so I was writing about all kinds of different things. And then I sort of realized that I had actually completely lost focus and that I was really just interested in too many things. Um, if, if somebody asked me, what do you write about? That was always a very awkward question for me to answer. Mm -hmm. So I sort of, I sort of knew that, uh, I, I knew that I needed a bit more focus. And now I'd always been, um, I'd always been interested in design as a practice, um, you know, how products and spaces are given their form and the role that they play in our lives. Um, and then it occurred to me that, um, it occurred to me that focusing on, you know, what I call the world of things, um, the world of artifacts, you know, consumer products, technologies, um, buildings, cities, the you know the inanimate world the world of things it occurred to me that this is a way really that i could that could provide a window onto so many aspects of modern life um and so yeah and so that's how i i ended up writing about i mean what i call design sort of as a shorthand but i really mean focusing on the role that objects and spaces uh, and, you know, artifacts, things made and produced and used by people, the role that th this plays in our lives. Because, you know, I realized that, you know, we live in a world where pretty much all the important things about us, you know, our aspirations, our social existence, our identities are mediated in one way or another by products. Um, and then, you know, the fact that, and then, and then you can start thinking about, well, how are those products made? How are they marketed to us? Uh, you start getting into these feedback loops where, you know, the products that we, that we want end up shaping our lives. Um, so really, yeah, I suppose that design offers a window into lots of other things that I'm interested in, as well as you know, being something that's interesting and it's a, for its own sake, you see what I mean. Do you mean, for instance, if you really enjoy chatting with a friend that's happening through an iPhone or a MacBook or Zoom or something like that? Uh, yeah, I suppose so. But I mean, maybe, you know, think about the things that you we want in life you know 
Well, more often than not, you know, pursuing our goals, whatever they may be, becoming the people who we want to be, um, you know, pursuing uh, status or money or meaning or whatever, more often than not, this involves some sort of interaction uh, with products, products that we buy and use. And on a much more basic level, even, you know, obviously making a living, just existing in the modern world requires using certain tools, right? So, you know, obviously um, our relationship with objects exists at many levels. You know, you have, you have tools, you have objects of desire, objects of status, you have the, the spaces in which all of these human dramas unfold. Um, but my very my basic idea was that if we flip things around and look at those objects as the starting point instead of beginning with the ideas like society, culture, politics, etc. If we start by looking at the objects, we might see these things in a fresh way. Very interesting. Very interesting. So you mentioned art. Uh, was that something you studied in university? Were you an art history uh, person? I see that throughout your, a lot of your articles, for instance, what we'll talk about later, your uh, piece on Christopher uh, Wren uh, sort of uh, has multiple tidbits and facts of history sort of intertwined, which I very much appreciated. So is, is your background uh of study? Is it in, in history? Is it in, in architecture? Where's sort of your uh, formal background uh, of study? Well, I mean, the truth is that by today's standards, I'm an extreme, extremely underqualified uh, person. I have I have a, a, an undergraduate degree in English literature and, and that's it. Um, so more or less everything else is is uh, is is self-taught. But no, I'm I've always I've been interested in art because uh, my mother is an artist. So I grew up with that. With, that was a big part of my life. Um, and when I started writing, I, you know, in one way or another, uh, I, you know, somebody sent me to review a, a, uh, a an exhibition. And, um, well, they, you know, the, the editor liked it and I really enjoyed doing it. And uh, I had a certain... I had some knowledge of it just based on my own interest. Uh, but, but you know, and, and then obviously, I mean, that that's the thing is, for me, it's always been that learning about things and writing go together because um, I become interested in something and then, you know, writing about it gives me a reason to learn about it, I suppose. I completely agree. Um, I think that <laughs> uh, approach, I feel that way uh, myself sometimes. So I sort of want to uh, turn our attention now, Vezi, to uh, the piece that sort of prompted us to want to get in touch with you and uh, talk to you. And this is a uh, essay that you published in May of 2023 um, at the New Statesman titled, at their outlet, you should only work four hours a day, sort of a punchy headline, I think uh, definitely attracted some notice. And I think you re-released it with a little more uh tempered of a headline of the lost art of leisure so we know we know you're a writer and not a uh, editor slash uh, headline crafter uh so that, that comes through but uh i think i'll quote uh for readers who have yet to read the piece and maybe we'll tempt them into doing that i'm going to quote from a uh, section maybe about probably a, actually about two-thirds of the way down but you say quote in a more civilized society, leisure would define our identities as much as labor does. To see what a distant prospect that is, try to imagine a politician talking about activities that might bring satisfaction to our lives half as much as he or she talks about, quote, ordinary working people, end quote, or, quote, hardworking families, end quote. Celebrating leisure would be branded out of touch, but that is because we've accepted the disgraceful assumption that enjoyable pastimes are only for those who can afford them end quote. So let, what, Vezi, what uh, made you want to take on this topic of leisure? Oh, what made me want to take it on? Well, you know, uh, I think it was because, you know, like many people, I'm, I'm, no, I've noticed that 
you know, we live in a world which is, uh, well, I mean, so one, one uh, interesting uh, piece which I came across about leisure uh, was written by Bertrand Russell. And, you know, he calls it, you know, the modern cult of efficiency. Um, and essentially, we live in a world which is uh, utilitarian, um, which is defined by efficiency. I think Russell says, you know, modern man thinks that everything ought to be done for the sake of something else and never for its own sake. Um, and I've also come across similar ideas uh, in Hannah Arendt, who said that, you know, utility uh, established as meaning generates meaninglessness. In the other way, in other words, if you're always doing something for the sake of something else, you know, the end result is, well, for the sake of what then, ultimately? Um, and, you know, to make it more concrete, uh, like many other people, I'd noticed that the world, today this cult of efficiency manifests itself uh, as a, a, an obsession with work, mm -hmm. which most people don't experience as an obsession because it's almost the water that we swim in now. The assumptions are so deep. Um, and so really I came to the idea of leisure because I've always been fascinated by history and sort of thinking about, you know, what are the things that people used to do for their own sake? And there is this whole dimension of human existence, which I would call leisure, which is things that you do for their own sake, because they're enjoyable, and because they develop, uh, they develop the human soul, the human mind, uh, they develop friendships, um, they develop personal relationships and, and public relationships, you know. Um, and this is what I thought, uh, you know, this seems to be suddenly a missing piece today um, where, the, you know, the, the, that to me seemed like the only, you know, rediscovering leisure seemed to me the only way that we could escape the obsession with work and productivity and efficiency. Yeah, I think of a quotation, I think maybe from C.S. Lewis, and I think he says something to the effect of, uh, friendship and art don't have survival value they have they offer value to having survived and this sort of uh desire to find what is an intrinsically choice worthy so to speak uh end and i think and i'm also interested in leisure i've written a little bit about it uh myself and i think that um for instance i was always bothered by the word uh, pastime and this idea of leisure as you're you're passing time you're trying to get to the next thing rather than sort of maybe alternatively um, pushing your way through work or something else to kind of get to that leisure as an end goal, especially if it's if it's used well. But I, I wonder if one of the main challenges today is that it seems that in our short world of shortened attention spans and all sorts of uh, uh, easy to consume medias, if people are generally spending their leisure time well, how do you sort of broad people to spend their leisure time well rather than sort of lounging about on uh, these short attention span video clips and such on social media and um, making sure that people are kind of uh, using their leisure to develop the sort of higher faculties that you're describing. Oh, uh, well, I mean, I think as, as I argued in that piece, you know, the idea of thinking of, uh, about leisure in terms of leisure time uh, is exactly the problem because um, you know that is something which is um, born from the modern work schedule in the sense that you have your work time and then you have your time off and your time off is your time that's personal freedom you know you can do with that time what you want that's your leisure time and this is the and you know that's how most people understand leisure and, and you know that is there's a, a semantic problem here because that is you know one of the main ways that we use the word leisure is just in terms of this 
time, you know, that's leisure time. That's how an economist would think about it, right? Um, but the issue is, you know, as I, as I argue in that piece, that because work is becoming increasingly amorphous, you know, these traditional, this traditional idea of work as something which has a place and a time, uh, is increasingly um, disappearing and being replaced by a much more individualized entrepreneurial mode of work where uh, your whole personality is something that you know you're cultivating for employers and technology is 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 uh, allowing you to is allowing work to spill over and it's almost an expectation that it will spill over into your own time. And so that whole idea that, you know, you have time where you do what you want and time where you belong to your employer. Um, if even you have an employer these days, or if like me, or if, you know, you're, you're a, a miserable freelancer, um, that whole idea is not going to work. And so you have to think instead about leisure as something social, which is that, you know, it too is a commitment that has to... Uh, it has to have its own social setting and its own social legitimacy in the sense that, you know, this is why, you know, leisure used to happen in the context of things like trade unions and churches and these sorts of things. It has to be something that you want to go and do because uh, other people are doing it too and, it's, and you know how enjoyable it is and you're going to go and do it together with other people. And I mean, that today sounds incredibly quaint, but... I can't think of any other way because, as I say, uh, you know, if you just treat leisure as a personal responsibility, you know, I will find time to relax. You know, we've all been there. Um, then, you know, that's a lost cause because ultimately, um, ultimately, you know, the culture is putting incredible pressure on you to use all of your time productively rather than um, rather than for leisure. Do you think a possible solution in sort of the framework you're describing, what's what would you say to people who say that sort of the proverbial, quote, master in the art of living draws less of a distinction between work and leisure? Because maybe in an ideal world, your work, insofar as possible, let's say writing or doing art, could be sort of wrapped up with a leisurely activity. Or should leisure be more uh, explicitly thought of sort of as you're describing here with people getting together and doing activities that are um, maybe more, um, I don't want to use the word amusement because it's uh, in, in orientation because it sounds maybe like it trivializes it, but everyone getting out and, and playing a tennis game or something like that. Yeah, you could, I mean, it, maybe it would help if we're more concrete here. I mean, sports is obviously a, a, a great and long longstanding um, form of leisure. Um, you know, there's music. Um, there's certain types of, I mean, you know, in Britain, our great form of leisure is going to the pub. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as you say, you know, these, these things, you know, that sounds like, you know, going to the pub sounds like, um, well, just, just having fun, you know. But actually, that's an institution where people go and, and they have conversations and they establish and they, you know, establish and renew social bonds and all of these kinds of things. Um, and. Uh, yeah, you know. Um, music, sports. Um, travel, these are all forms of leisure, right? OK, um, now. Your question was, how do you actually kind of try and put down root? How do how does that put down roots today? Is that what you, is that what you were asking? Well, I'm also thinking about. It seems as though um, I think if, for instance, uh, someone like George W. Bush or Dwight Eisenhower in retirement, and they take up uh, leisure uh, painting, for instance, as as leisure, mm -hmm. and but then you start to think there are obviously other people who are painters or they are musicians. Is there a way to sort of make make it so your leisure and your work are one and the same? Uh, and the yes. Desirable goal. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, okay. So, so that's I, yeah. That that was your question. Was you know, shouldn't you enjoy your work in that way? Um, well, it's, and, it's, it's possible. Obviously, we 
you and I are no strangers. Oh, yeah, yes. I mean, it is true. I mean, so there's an interesting. Um, so, you know, I think if you think, I mean, one of the earliest people to write about leisure was Aristotle, right? And he, and you know, the way that he saw the world was work is essentially about necessity. It's your, you know, it's your, it's literally providing sustenance for your biological functions, you know, providing food and a shelter of your head. That's what work is about. Uh, and therefore work is a means to an end, whereas leisure is not a means to an end. Leisure is something you do for its own sake. Now, today, these categories are blurred because we're all encouraged to, to take as our vocations, as our careers, things that we will find meaningful. And I mean, I mean, put it this way, I didn't go into writing for the money. <laughs> Right. I did it because it's satisfying. So I completely understand where you're coming from. But the, the, the problem is that, um, again, take it from me, even if you do, so, even if you choose as your vocation, something which you find satisfying, um, you know, all of these, um, all of these uh, instrumental and and just and uh, worldly concerns will start pressing in on you you know um we all have to deal with ambition with with wanting to be uh, more recognized with wanting to earn more money all of these kinds of things and that doesn't make it less satisfying but it does mean that you still need another side of your life which is not in any way associated with those worldly needs and ambitions does that make sense? I think it does. And it's interesting because, as you said, uh, I think as school children, you're often encouraged to try to combine the two. But then there are a lot of people who sort of argue, perhaps more persuasively, that one might be better off trying to just have sort of a work that they do and then take out some of these other pursuits in sort of, a, I, don't, I know you don't like it sort of conceptualized in a temporal sense, but it, it's so domain of their lives that sort of is divided and that they focus on that to deal with their self-actualization so to speak or um yeah it's 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 um i don't really I, I definitely can't give anyone advice in that sense because i'm still far from sure that i made the right decision but i i suppose that you know the, this choice increasingly doesn't exist you know the um you know, the whole world of employment is becoming increasingly precarious. It is seeping into into uh, into other into it. You know, it, it is flow, overflowing its boundaries, as I said. And so, you know, this idea that do those jobs still exist? I mean, for some people, they do. If you're very talented and you, you're in the right business, I'm. You know, of course, there are still people who clock in at a certain time, clock out at a certain time, and fantastic. Um, but, you know, fewer and fewer people have that option because work demands more of them or it's not available in that sort of highly defined format. Um, and the other thing I would say is that I don't think it's, it's, I don't think it's either or, you know, because I don't think that, I, I think, you, you know, you should, meaningful work is as important to life as leisure, I think. Mm -hmm. I just think that we've lost the balance. Um, so, you know, you can have your meaningful work, but then you can also have your leisure. Well, I guess, especially as we talk about these days, and there are more and more people who are working gig jobs, and they've got their phones pinging every second. And yeah. I think even people I know are out on the tennis court, and where, where I play tennis, they have a no cell phone policy, but they'll still try to sneak a look and maybe step to the parking lot and make a quick call. And I guess with some of back to this discussion of devices and products with these sort of devices or products around us all the time that are pinging and demanding our sort of work attention, especially in the United States. I, I you can fill me in because you obviously lived in, lived in Britain or very familiar with South Africa, but here I think this is a very workaholic um, society, especially in certain um, segments of that society. The, the work can be really all consuming. It's very interesting when you kind of emerge from certain universities and such. And there are a lot of folks who studied the sort of things you studied. And next thing you know, they're 
world is sort of taken over by Excel and pinging phones. And I, I think it could be a real challenge, especially in America, and I'm sure in London and other places to, um, in the in the world we live in today, to kind of carve out that or have a, the right orientation towards leisure. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, it is absolutely technology, which is, you know, that's the medium um, through which you know, work is is uh, work and work like uh, activities are, um, you know, all you know seem to be expanding all the time. Um, but this is why, I mean, maybe this is uh, you know this is one of those this is one of those uh, this is one of those areas where. You know, the more sort of concretely you talk about it, the more specifically you talk about it, maybe, you know, you're also making it less relevant to everybody. But, you know, you think of, you say you say don't think about um, don't think about leisure temporally or you'd rather I was saying that you shouldn't have your leisure time, and your work time or you shouldn't think about it like that. But you can absolutely. And I think you should or we should try. To make to you know to to give leisure some structure so that uh if there are certain things that you love doing you find other people who love doing it and you organ you commit yourselves collectively to doing that every week or every month or whatever and you have to just be as committed to doing that thing for its own sake as you are to um, you know, pursuing your worldly needs and ambitions, um, and so that's how I think. Because I mean, and this is the, this is the the sort of the 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 thing that I was trying to get across in that piece is that you know this has all happened because of of, of social changes, uh, you know, in the sense that you know if you have if you live in a place where there is a calendar of events. Uh, and where everybody part takes part in those events and where there are social structures in place which are not only oriented towards work but also oriented towards the good things in life. Well, it's interesting because and I think- Then it becomes much easier, right? You and I were trying to schedule a time for this discussion. And I think one of the other possible times you were attending a, a festival. Yeah, <laughs> well, exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the town that I've just moved to, uh, well, I moved here six months ago, um, precisely to try and sort of lead a less fluid existence. Uh, you know, uh, th this town has um, the UK's biggest uh, bonfire night celebration. Do you know what bonfire night is, Guy Fawkes night? From uh, the 5th of November? Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. And so, um, you know, that's that's a big event on the calendar here. And, uh, and, you know, this is, I mean, personally, this is the kind of approach that I'm trying to take to it, which is to really uh, think about, you know, think about your, your uh, think about your annual calendar in terms of cycles and rhythms. And there are certain moments every year which you should try to mark and mark it with other people if you can. One of the things I like about what you just said about getting something on the calendar every week is, um, as some people might recall, back in June, uh, I recorded an interview with Clay Rutledge. You may have seen his work. Uh, he's an existential mm -hmm. yeah. psychologist, and um, he's done some articles with us. And I'm, I, one of the things I like about him is he often suggests actionable things to do. So I know a lot of other psychologists and such, they there's a lot of rumination and such, but Clay will come in, he'll say, if you want to increase your happiness, do very specific things, spend more time with friends, do some exercise, just really straightforward things. So that's one of the things I like about what uh, you were just saying, Bezzy, is you said, all right, get that weekly tennis game on the calendar, mark off the holidays, go to the sports game, get, get yeah. that on the calendar. And, and make sure you go for a drink afterwards. Say it again? Make sure you go for a drink afterwards. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, um, when you're talking about pubs, this also intersects with, uh, I think, another major issue. And I know one of our writers, Henry George, has talked about uh, when Britain appointed a minister of loneliness. And in a lot of parts of the West and 
perhaps all over the world, there seems to be a particularly acute problem of people feeling uh, lonely or cut off. This is a bit what Johan Hari, I think, is getting at when he titled his book on depression, Lost Connections. And it seems as though, I remember there was, uh, it was kind of a uh, viral story a couple of years ago where there was a county or town in Ireland where they were considering altering the uh, legal limit for drinking to try to help people with depression and suicide to get them to a pub which as you're saying is an important part it's of British Irish culture is getting to that pub. So uh, how can we sort of use, I, I know we're trying to get away from the whole concept of utilitarian things and I don't even want to say use leisure, but how does leisure sort of intersect with possibly um, ameliorating some of these uh, loneliness issues in a lot of places? Well, I think it, I think it can precisely if you see it as something that should be social. I mean, as I say in the, uh, you know, as I wrote in that in that essay, it's not as if you know you can you can mention all these leisure activities. You know, you can say, oh, but what about cycling? You know, what about football? Uh, you know, what about getting together and and you know discussing books or discussing art? What about, you know, the thing is, like, you know, of course, everybody does these things, but they do them as hobbies, which is, uh, you know, which is, which is, again, an, uh, an individual and personal thing. And it becomes part of your kind of character rep repertoire, you know, like, oh, you're the guy who likes tennis, aren't you? Well, you know, that's the kind of thing you slot into that part of your CV or whatever. But, you know, um, and. Yeah, and that for me is, is you know. If all of this ties together in some way, it, it's precisely in the fact that, you know, leisure has is disappearing or, you know, that leisure is disappearing precisely because it's something that has to be defended collectively. It's something that has to have a presence in the culture. Uh, uh, you right. know, that's where, it, it's, that's where it has to get its legitimacy from. And you know, if that is true, then it's also a way to to um, make connections with other people. Because I think in a lot of cases, in America at least, which I think is often conceptualized as a place where work is exalted above all else, once you maybe graduate from college and until you retire, if it's not a Saturday or Sunday and you're doing anything other than slaving away in a lot of circles, people are kind of looking at you like, you slacker, you you lazy guy and that's maybe where one where you need sort of that cultural social rediscovery where everyone gets on board and says actually it's good that tommy is out maybe playing golf at thursday at four and he's taking care of his responsibilities for the day and there's no reason he should just sit and try to look busy and maybe he should actually get out there and sort of try to enjoy himself a little bit yeah absolutely and i think the other the other piece that is um that i'm very aware is 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 totally missing here is that um i think if you have young children you're going to hear this conversation and go what are these people talking about like when do i have time to do it? you know but that comes back to what we we're saying about it having to be entrenched in the culture because leisure is also something that families should be able to take part in together um but you know and the very fact that it seems ridiculous to say to someone with children oh you know um we, we you know we've arranged this festival you know there's going to be uh there's going to be bands playing um there's going to be picnic tables you know it, it just as imagine it as quaint as you want uh and and, and you know the, the, the you know that will to many people with young children will just sound just absurd but the fact is that's precisely because it you know it's you know somehow the culture no longer has the resources to make that available to everybody so I'm thinking in terms of cross-national comparisons. So I think there are certain countries, for instance, where uh, workers have more weeks off, say a longer summer vacation than others. Have you thought about what countries or what societies, I know you kind of are saying across the board, leisure is a lost art, leisure is under siege. Are there some places that are better or worse than others? Well, you know, I hesitate to make too many comparisons because, um, you know, I've only, I only know so much about other places, but I certainly feel that, uh, you know, 
and in every place leisure has its own sort of accent you know coming from one place you might not necessarily recognize what what you know passes for leisure in another place but uh you know just to make the obvious point whenever i visit the mediterranean um you know there seems to be uh a much more healthy uh public culture there um where um you know you go out and about and you know people will be talking to each other they'll be going to the cafe every day they'll be you know and you know i'm 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 aware that i'm uh, you know veering dangerously towards stereotypes here but th that's genuinely the impression that i get just as a traveler is, is that you know what we have in the uk you know in terms of our public life um seems much less generous and inviting than what I have seen in in certain other places but beyond that I yeah I, I'm not sure that I can uh, can draw too many contrasts and comparisons because I'm not sure so in the title that you give the piece on your website the lost art of leisure it seems to be built into that title that there was a time when people did leisure better maybe in the not too distant past. When were people, when did people generally have a better relationship to leisure? Well, I mean, there's an enormous irony here because uh, in the, uh, I, I mentioned uh, in that piece about leisure, you know, I haven't read about um, British society in the early 20th century. Uh, it just really struck me how much organized uh, leisure there was, you know, because at that time there were really established um, institutions in terms of trade unions and uh, and religious institutions and and, um, you know, also, you know, based on neighborhood and these kinds of things. Um, and it really struck me how much people were were getting together uh and playing sports and playing in brass bands and um you know dancing and all of these things dancing is and, a yeah. great example of uh, an art that's increasingly lost my grandparents generation you would know how to dance you would yeah know yeah. Say, yeah yeah nowadays uh, i go to events and people are making their best effort my maybe myself included if i could be pride for my seat but the overwhelming majority of people at least the events I go to they don't know how to dance they're doing the best they can they're maybe dancing with some enthusiasm but it's it's clear in in the overwhelming majority of cases that that is not a skill that has sort of been inculcated in them like in the period you're describing yeah yeah precisely but I mean as I say it's ironic because it's exactly at this time that people in Britain notably Bertrand Russell the philosopher who I already mentioned and John Maynard Keynes the economist start wow. writing start writing these pieces saying uh we need to we need to rediscover leisure and leisure is something that they associate with uh sort of peasant societies and with aristocracy so they associate it with the pre-modern world and so you know we're looking back from today you say, oh, well, they seem to, they seem to know, uh, they seem to understand what leisure is about then. But at the same time, there were these very influential people at that time saying, talking about the modern cult of efficiency and, you know, um, and all of these kinds of things. And they're, they're pushing the golden age of leisure, you know, back into a pre-modern society. So I think that, uh, you know, if you think about it like that, there's two options. Either things have been getting progressively worse or uh or this is a problem that every society that every generation has to face in striking this balance but either way um yeah maybe it was the wrong title for the piece but i just to me i i suppose the the reason i said that is because uh i do think that leisure had more of a social dimension than it does today at, at the very least back to what i was and back to we're talking about leaning to stereotypes back to what i was getting at before about you know sort of younger people on social media and such um because as you point out leisure being organized around uh, trade unions and things like that so in america at least we seem to have a problem where 
a lot of golf clubs, country clubs are in decline and they're not able to get in overwhelming majority of cases, younger people interested in them to sign up to in many cases. Oh, well, this is the bowling alone thesis, right? Um, well, I guess that, as I understand it, you know, maybe there's some, some of the more upshots on that. Well, was, that was a little while back as well, but you know, also some of the yeah. multiculturalism takeaways, but just even in the past couple of years, there's been sort of this acute problem of a lot of golf courses, country clubs being unable to attract uh, new people to get involved. And, you know, it's an older population doing this. So I actually don't know the answer to this. And I'm wondering what are some of these younger people doing for leisure? So just based on what I'm seeing in certain cases, maybe from a limited basis or also kind of extrapolating, it seems that there's a lot of this sort of getting involved with having a screen basically in front of your face and, um, I remember when I was in college there, we had a professor and he said his wife is working on some sort of virtual reality thing where, you know, you'd be in front of a screen, you know, 14 hours a day and all the students kind of shrieked at horror. And he said, you're already in front of one, maybe 12 now. It's not that big of a, a big of a difference. So I'm just trying to figure out um, generationally, as you kind of just pointed out, this each generation yeah. struggle. It, are, are the newer generations now, is it a misconception or are they actually potentially choosing um more solitary screen time in favor of more uh communal leisure and i know for instance i had, had a, a teacher stored offer and he thought that music for instance um was always meant to be shared communally and instead of doing it in earbuds you should do it with a group of people so maybe we could imagine a world where people are all watching a television show together watching the big game or watching the super bowl but you know maybe there's not as much physical component to the leisure for this generation or maybe that's not true i don't know yeah, I mean, I have to say that, you know, if when I look at the generation below me, I honestly, or, or maybe the, the phrase is the generation after me anyway, uh, I honestly think they may as well be living 200 years in the future. That's how little I understand them. Because, you know, this, this technological revolution has been so radical. Uh, and, you know, we've not at all even started to, to uh, consider the implications. Um, and, you know, this is how modern societies work. They're in a constant state of revolution. Every generation is alienated from, from you know, from the world of, of that the, the previous generation made. Um, but th that's definitely the case now. And um, all I can say to that is, you know, it is true that in different, you know, across time, leisure does take different forms. And this is why... You know, it, maybe I can't say for those people what their leisure should look like. In fact, I, I definitely can't. But the principle remains that leisure is about doing something for its own sake. And, uh, you know, is, is, that, is that screen based culture that those people are? involved in is that creating space for that is it cultivating that maybe but it's definitely not the relationship that my uh generation has with screens because the way that digital interfaces have been designed um is it, it it, you know, there's a relationship between the individual attention span and what is happening on the screen, which is far from leisurely. Um, it's a sort of state of intense distraction, uh, which is quite dis difficult to describe. But and and the fact is that it's gamified as well. In the sense that you know the 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 way that it's designed has has been has drawn heavily on the design of video games in order to make it addictive, and that's all about reaching goals. Uh, you know, um, more views, more followers, more likes, blah 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 blah. And that is a very instrumental way of thinking, which again is exactly the opposite of what I think leisure is about. Because you think of someone playing Angry Birds or something, and I'm not based on my react the reactions I'm seeing when they're. I've never played the game, but when you hit the wrong bird or whatever, it doesn't seem like it's that leisurely. 
um, I, I mean, I honestly, uh, I mean, I don't know. I, I, you know, I, uh, I, I, I view that whole side of life with, I mean, I have to sort of go in there like a kind of explorer to try and sort of understand what's happening, but I view it with immense suspicion and I try to, 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 you know, stay away from it as much as I can. So, um, <laughs> So, Vezzi, we spent most of the time talking about leisure, which I think makes yeah. sense. But in our remaining little bit here, um, I think I'd like to give everyone a taste of, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe as you alluded to before, and as we discussed, your kind of um, maybe uh, ultimate bailiwick, which is art and architecture. So I just want to draw a brief attention to a very interesting piece I think you did in February of this year at Unheard. Uh, titled Christopher Wren, Godfather of the Technocrats. And can you start maybe by just uh, giving uh, an overview of what you're talking about in that piece for folks who haven't read it, and then uh, maybe we'll just touch on a couple points from it. Um, sure. So I was asked to write something for the 300th anniversary of uh, Christopher Wren's death. And for people who don't know about Christopher Wren, um, he is an architect, a uh, 17th and early 18th century architect in the UK, um, who built some of our most famous buildings, uh, most famously St. Paul's Cathedral in London. Uh, he built in a style which is somewhere between Renaissance and Baroque. Um, and yeah, he's, he's, you know, the fact that a magazine is asking me to write about, about you know, uh, something about this guy, you know, he is with one of the few architects in British history who people are familiar with, at least the name. You know, everybody knows that Wren built churches in the city of London. Everybody knows that he built St. Paul's. Um, so the argument that I made in that piece was that uh, you know, the, the the place that Christopher Wren occupies today in the public imagination, especially St. Paul's, is as an example of, you know, a time when architecture used to be beautiful. It used to be classical. Uh, it used to have domes and spires and all of these kinds of things. Um, and what I argue is actually that uh, really Christopher Wren can be seen actually as a precursor or a forerunner of the most um, technocratic modern architecture. And that this sort of fondness for Wren is, is an illusion created by history. You know, um, what he was doing at his time was a kind of uh, anticipation of the i the obsession with technology and with structural expression um and with geometry that we see in the most modern architecture so i will just read uh an excerpt from where you sort of talk about um a technocratic society so you write Quote, but technocratic monuments emerge from technocratic societies where fixation with how things work drowns out the question of what they're actually for. The natural and human worlds are treated as processes to be managed with politics re reduced to measurable outputs, higher growth, fewer emissions, a more equal distribution of benefits. Technology is held in awe, but more for its functional qualities than any greater purpose it serves, end quote. And I can't help but read this and see some significant parallels to some of the things we're talking about with leisure and utility. Absolutely. Yes, indeed. Yeah, but it's the, I mean, I come, I come back to that. Um, I come back to that uh, Arendt, uh, Hannah Arendt quote that I love so much, you know, utility established as meaning generates meaninglessness. It's the same, I, you know, as I, I think that what I was talking about there um to be clear uh was a was a particular architect um whose work um 
I really, I describe it as technocratic because it really, for me, exists as a monument and a celebration of this whole approach to life, um, which is about functionality and efficiency. And just the, the, and you know, where technology becomes perversely, you know, it becomes a kind of an end in itself, but not one that gives us the things that leisure does, for example. It becomes a kind of a god that we worship, you know, just because of what it can do. So maybe just to close, um, can you talk a little bit about, obviously you, you write a lot about art and architecture um, and architecture, as we talk a lot about uh, in the United States and other places, is sort of this public act that, unlike a painting sitting in a house, is something that is perhaps representative of a certain state um, or a certain time in a society, and what that society sort of um, embodies or represents. And um, do you, is there a certain type of rediscovery of? of architecture or um, buildings that are beautiful for their own sake that you would like to see? And if so, do you think that's in any way uh, on the horizon or there's any optimism to see that happen? Well, I mean, this is actually something which is extremely controversial uh, in the UK, certainly, uh, because the conservative government that we've had uh, for the last, um, well, for the last 13 years, well, although some of that was in coalition, um, but they have been uh, encouraging or trying to um, sanction and give support to certain uh, approaches to the built environment which favor traditional ideas of beauty and and you know what public space should be about um and this has become completely uh, enmeshed in the culture war over here um and you know it's you know because a, a lot of architects uh, are saying are essentially see this as as some kind of a, a very dangerous form of nostalgia uh you know, they believe that, I mean, from their point of view, right? It's like, imagine if you're a painter and someone was saying, you don't get to do some, you don't get to take your craft somewhere new. We like the impressionists, so you should paint like them. Now, obviously architecture is very different because as you say, it's an inherently public form of art. Nonetheless, I think that that's how architects feel because they approach it from their own angle. Um, and, you know, and as I say, they, they, they view this idea of returning. I mean, the big thing in the UK is Georgian architecture, right? Uh, that that's extremely popular here. There's definitely a revealed preference because if you just look at house prices, older houses are just worth much more. People do want to live in them, but architects don't want to build them. And there's also a case to, uh, and in part, this is actually, this whole discussion is, is moot because, you know, what really uh, determines the character of buildings here is is not architects, but property developers. And they couldn't build something beautiful. They wouldn't know how to, even if, even if you ordered them to, because they just have templates that they use, which are absolutely based on doing things as cheaply as possible, maximizing profit. Um, and, you know, so... What would what do I think? I mean, I've written about this a few times. I've written about this whole sort of controversy a few times. But I feel undecided because it all comes down to this idea of pastiche, right? In the sense that <clears throat> people who prefer a modernist approach to architecture, they say, okay, you want to build like the Georgians built. These are just going to be you know, I think that the 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 uh, the phrase they use is like toy houses or something. You know, you know these you know these are going to be they, there's something inherently fake about it. It's like this is a form of building that belonged to a much earlier time, and you just want to somehow like bring this back into existence just because you like the way it looks. 
you know, but then on the other hand, in places like Poland and Germany, many cities have been doing exactly that. They've been rebuilding, you know, whether you want to say you can either call it a replica or a pastiche, you know, whichever way you view it, but they've been rebuilding medieval um, town centers. And so it can be done. And so I think, you know, I don't really know how I feel about this, apart from that, it, the fact that uh, it, 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 it says something very revealing about, well, <laughs> it says something revealing, I'm not sure exactly about what, but the fact that, you know, all the great architecture of the past, you know, uh, came about because somebody tried something new, right? Um, you know, there would be, I mean, go back to St. Paul's, you know, that, that building is much beloved today, you know, uh, held as an example of great traditional British architecture. It wasn't traditional at all. St. Paul's was a Gothic cathedral, which burned down and Christopher Wren re decided to rebuild it in this Italian Renaissance style. He had to keep the dome of that church hidden behind scaffolding for 33 years because he knew how much people would hate it. Well, and, for over, and for over a century, they did hate it. They saw it as, as Catholic and Popish and, and foreign to an artificial and foreign to, uh, to uh, British tradition. And so my point being that, you know, you, we're in somewhere very difficult where a lot of people are feel extremely alienated from modern architecture. They find it ugly uh, and cold um, and unforgiving. And yet at the same time, if we just go back to building how people built in the past, we are saying that we cannot produce anything. You know, we are not, we, we cannot produce anything as a civilization anymore. You know, the time for creating new things is over. We are just gonna replay the best hits. And so that's the dilemma we're stuck on, I think. Well, it's an interesting point. And also that a lot of, especially whether in literature or other places, a lot of works that are now thought of as classic or part of the Western canon were obviously very revolutionary at the time and in style and form and other sorts of things. And uh, I think it's the same in, in art and, and in architecture in many cases where at the time people were saying, what is this? But now we say, well, that is, you know, that's part of the Western great works or something like that. It's, um, but, but yes, but, Yeah, well, there it is. Bezzy Dutoy, thank you so much for, for speaking with me. I'm glad we got to kind of zero in on two of your articles and then maybe draw some parallels and kind of an overview of what you write about in general. So thanks so much for talking with me.